everyone. My name is Chris Fernari. I'm the editor of Brewbound.com. Thank you all for coming out to Brew Talks this evening at Harpoon Brewery. Um, for our friends tuning in at home, uh, we're here in snowy, cold, uh, miserable Boston. Uh, but a hundred or so, maybe more, folks decided to trudge out here and join us tonight. So thank you. Big round of applause for everyone for coming out. Uh, for, for anyone who hasn't uh, joined us at one of these events in the past, um, we just like to gather people for beers, about an hour's worth of business discussion, um, talk about sort of current events that are happening in craft beer, um, things that are happening either on a local or a regional level, um, topics that I just happen to find interesting, um, and uh, you know, hopefully get through some of the questions that you might have for the folks that we put up here uh, in these seats uh, along the way. Um, if I'm not mistaken, somebody will be walking around at some point, perhaps with a handheld microphone to uh, grab one or two questions at the end of the panel discussion. Um, we've got two talks on tap tonight. Um, the first, uh, I'll introduce these folks sitting next to me. Uh, JC Tetro is the co-owner, co-founder of Trillium Brewery, uh, just about a mile that way uh, in a tiny little uh, tap room, brewery, uh, no bathroom, uh, you name it, nine foot ceilings, making it happen with some of the best beer in Boston right now. Uh, Megan is right next door actually to Trillium at row 34. Um, she's put together one of the better beer lists that I've seen in quite a long time um, and when she can get her hands on uh, uh, JC's beer, she definitely does. Uh, and then Peter Burke is the national sales manager for Cisco Brewers, uh, fine brewery out of Nantucket. Um, they are part of Massachusetts, as he likes to remind everyone who's not from uh, <laughs> this neck of the woods. Yeah, it's a little bit of a learning curve. Um, so we kind of wanted to kick off the event tonight just by talking a little bit uh, about the beer culture in Boston um, and you know some of the other cities around the country um, that maybe are a little bit more developed uh, in terms of breweries, in terms of uh, on-premise retail establishments that you know, are really passionate about serving beer, um, that, that, that really uh, take hold of the local brewery scene and make it sort of a part of the fabric of, of what that city is about. Um, and I don't know, I've had plenty of conversations with folks myself that seem to think that you know, while Boston has a lot of good attributes with the beer scene, that there could be a lot more um, and, and there could be, there's a lot to be done here to kind of build up the scene. So we'll s sort of start there. Um, maybe everyone, I know I've sort of introduced you, but maybe everyone could kind of introduce themselves, talk about their sort of passion in the beer space and, and you know, what excites them about beer in Boston. Sure, so I'm, I'm JC. Uh, as Chris said, we started a uh, very small 2,300 square foot brewery uh, in the Fort Point Channel neighborhood in Boston. Um, my story and, uh, is not terribly different than lots of brand new breweries that opened up across the country and across the world, really. Um, passionate home brewer, uh, couldn't shake the, uh, the notion of brewing for a living. Um, my wife and I, in a fit of romanticism on our honeymoon, decided to open a brewery. Uh, didn't have the money necessarily to do it all in at once. Uh, worked full time up until April of last year, so a little bit more than a year after we opened. Um, we've got a little 10 barrel brew house and uh, a little staff and uh, almost two years later we actually just announced an expansion uh, in nearby Canton, unfortunately not right in Boston itself. We'll talk a little bit about that soon. Hi everyone, um, I'm Megan. Is Should be coming on soon here, hopefully. I can project, I did drum <laughs> I've worked in the service industry um, pretty much since the first day of college, and I always say that I got into beer because I spent all my tips on beer. Um, you muted? muted? I'm muted. There we go. Everyone hear me? Um, so I always say I got into the craft beer industry because I spent all of my tips as a server on beer. I've worked for uh, the wonderful restaurant group that I worked for for a number of years, um, and when, was, when I was sort of brought onto the project of Row 34 and I found out what Garrett and Jeremy and Shore and Skip were planning to do with the beer program, I pretty much did this and asked if I could do it and was given the opportunity. This is my first time curating a list and it's been such a phenomenal experience. Um, for those of you that know me, my passion within beer lies within 
sours, uh, wild, fermented, uh, crazy, crazy styles. Uh, that's definitely what I uh, really, really care about, and I try to translate that with my list. Uh, so my name is Pete. I work for Cisco uh, out on Nantucket. Um, I'm actually based out of here in Boston. I, uh, I'll give you a little history of the brewery if you don't know it. It's a brewery, winery, distillery. The winery actually came first. Uh, the brewery opened in about 95 and the distillery in 2000. So we have a, a triple threat business, which is great. We see a ton of business on island in the summer, but obviously in the winter, uh, that pretty much ceases to exist. The harbor right now, I think, is still frozen over. So uh, if there's anyone watching from Nantucket, uh, good luck getting off the island. Um, <laughs> So we, we do a lot of business off island. We have a bunch of sales reps located in New England. We, we distribute to about 20 states where obviously our lion's share of the business is done here in Mass. So we focus a lot on, you know, I know that we're not part of the Boston market geographically speaking, but as a territory, it is our biggest territory uh, in terms of sales. So it, it matters a lot to us what happens in Boston. And, and it's, uh, it's great to be up here with, with uh, beer celebrities of, of Boston. This is great. So, uh, w you know, we'll kind of start there with Boston. Um, you know, there was a distributor that I was chatting with recently who um, had sort of said that, you know, there's a, a handful of bars in the Boston area that are, um, uh, he described them as favorable or engaged and passionate about craft beer. Um, and for anyone, you know, who's from this area or drinks beer in this area, you all sort of know uh, which accounts those are. I mean, the Lord Hobos, the Deep Ellums, the Public Houses, the Row 34s, the Stoddards. Um, I mean, the places that you know where you can get a wide list of craft beers, bottled, draft. Um, craft beer drinkers know to go to these places. Uh, but I always try to think of markets as sort of a tourist or a traveler, um, you know, kind of stumbling down the street in a place that's foreign that you don't know. Um, if you're walking through the streets of Boston, um, it, it, it could seem pretty sparse. There's not brewery tap rooms like there are in Denver, um, there's not, you're not tripping over um, amazing craft beer bars like you might be in, in Portland, Oregon. Um, you know, e even now a city like San Francisco has its fair share of breweries um, and, and bars that are dedicated to, to craft beer. There's nobody in that elevator back there, that's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Somebody's messing with me. I'm just going to ask the question now. Um, so, JC, you managed to, you know, sort of, I guess, push through all of that and still uh, start your brewery here in Boston. And I guess, um, you know, th yeah, there's Harpoon, there's Sam, there's a few on the outskirts, but it was a nightmare getting your brewery started in Boston. Talk to us a little bit about that process and then, you know, eventually what led you to have to move out of the city to, to expand. So, we evaluated tons of spaces. Uh, we had a, an incredibly tight budget um, and eventually we settled on the spot in Boston because it was in Boston and I was uh, overly optimistic about what people were telling me about being able to get through a zoning variance process, a building permitting process because of my innate tenacity <laughs> about details and paperwork and so forth. Um, but it was a nine and a half month zoning variance process. And then we could apply for a building permit, which took three and a half months. So in the time that it took us just to start swinging hammers, people would be able to, you would be able to start uh, brewing operations at a, another facility in um, a bordering town. So um, the, uh, the, 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 the kind of the barrier to entry in Boston from a paperwork pers perspective um, and even today, outside of just the New Market District, um, industrial district in Boston, um, that still exists, unfortunately. And, and even just from a real estate standpoint, too, uh, I know when we chatted last week, um, you were describing just the properties that are here and, and the, the physical limitations of some of these spaces. I mean, it's not really a friendly city to do business in as a brewery. So breweries, uh, breweries are production facilities or manufacturing facilities. You need a loading dock, you need three-phase power, you need uh, weight-bearing floors, you need floor drains, you need all kinds of infrastructure that a law office doesn't need, that a financial institution doesn't need. You just need, you know, class A office space. And that infrastructure is not easy to find. Or if it, it did once exist in an, sort of a, an industrial area in Boston, it's sort of been co-opted in price per square foot has, has gone through uh, many multiples um, since it once did exist. So uh, the opportunity to find a 10,000 square foot space with 
high clearance ceilings and a loading dock and et cetera, et cetera. It just, it just doesn't exist um, in Boston, unfortunately. So there's the permitting process that's an issue. Uh, there's the physical limitations that are an issue. Sort of brings me to my question. I mean, it, is, that, um, it, is that what sort of stalls uh, the beer culture a little bit when, you, when you're not able to have breweries in the city? And, and I'll ask this to all you guys. Do you feel that having breweries actually in the downtown area and in you know, Boston proper or in whatever city you're in proper um, it is, is vital to having a beer culture, a good beer culture? I, I, you can't say that it, it wouldn't help. Um, you know, the, the barrier to entry, so breweries that start today are started by, I guess, guys like me, guys that have uh, an, an irrational dream for starting up uh, a business for um, something that you're passionate in, and you probably don't have a whole hell of a lot of money. So um, if it's gonna take a whole hell of a lot of money, plus you need a year's worth of cash flow, you kind of just say, it, can't, it just can't be in Boston. Um, we meandered and we finally got to operational, but man, it was tight. And we actually, there's a couple moments there where we were making phone calls saying we were gonna have to back out of our lease and so on and so forth. So um, we were down to the wire about actually being able to get functional. So um, if, if the real estate scenario was different and the licensing scenario was different in Boston, we'd probably see um, breweries popping up right in Boston or Alston, Brighton, all the different neighborhoods and not necessarily over in, in Everett. Right. And, and there's a few. I mean, you see, you see it happening in Somerville. Obviously, you know, Cambridge Brewing has had a nice business for quite some time. But um, Megan, I'll ask you, I mean, for your business in particular, um, would it be better for you to have more uh, Boston breweries sort of in your neighborhood, um, in, within walking distance, I guess, to some of the restaurants that, that um, are, are pouring craft beer, um, as opposed to Boston-based brands that don't really have a physical hub that people can visit after they might try it at your bar? Well, sure. I mean, I, I think that, you know, I mean, just looking at the relationship that Row 34 has with Trillium, I think that there is something that you can't really... I mean, you, there's that relationship, the proximity that we are to each other um, is really special and can't be recreated with something that might be miles and miles away. I think that, you know, it, it's something that not only you, you draw a connection to the beer itself because of the place and where it's from, I mean, it, it definitely is really important, but I don't think it's essential. Um, I do think that, you know, we all kind of know that, that Boston is very prohibitive in terms of opening up spaces and and we've seen a lot of really wonderful things going on you know outside of the city limits and and you've also seen people's eagerness to push themselves out of Boston and explore those spaces that hasn't hindered in my opinion right so from a retailer's perspective um, do you think that the beer culture is good in Boston you know it's funny I, I in a way I think that it's very difficult to compare us to a city like San Diego or, or Denver where, you know, you look at C San Diego, for example, as, as sort of this, you know, pinnacle of West Coast IPAs and has really put a footprint on the map in terms of the craft brewing industry. I think there's a lot of really awesome things happening in Boston right now. And maybe we are, you know, a couple steps behind a couple other cities, but the fact that there is spark and there's passion and there's energy and there's people that are doing things that are exceptional is only pushes me to see that we're moving forward. Do, do you see that, Peter? Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's tricky to, to compare, you know, apples to apples in terms of Boston to uh, San Diego. When you look at just you know, the physical limitations you were talking about, JC, it's like, all right, Boston has 48 square miles and San Diego is 4,000 square miles. And there's over 3 million people in San Diego and there's or 600,000 in the Boston. So it's, you know, if you, you either have to slim down the San Diego to all right, downtown city hall and draw a 48 square mile radius and compare that to here, or, you know, you can dice up the numbers any way you want. I think, as Megan said, there's a lot of good things going on in Boston beer culture, but Boston beer culture isn't necessarily limited to beers brewed in Boston. I, I'm, I'm all for the home guy. Like, 
I love being part of the Mass Brewers Guild. I love that Boston has a lot of good beer options. But if you start to just say that Boston's beer culture is limited to the beers that are brewed here, I think you right. can start to get a tricky situation. Because if you go to San Diego and you ask about their beer culture, sure, they have a huge list of home, home brewed beers. And some retail accounts will say, hey, where are you from? Be like, oh, Massachusetts. Like, well, we don't buy any beers out of a 100 mile radius. It's like really hard to sell into that account coming from Nantucket. <laughs> but then you look at the beers in the 100 mile radius and you can't really blame them. Yeah. So right. if you extend past that, you know, they'll, they'll have beers out of Oregon or out of uh, you know, all the major hot spots, even Florida, the Cigar City and a couple of the hot brewers coming out. Um, their beer culture it includes a strong home base and then a strong, you know, I would say import, uh, but, you know, d domestic import right. from other craft breweries around the country. So that's something that needs, I think, has yet to change here. There's a lot of new breweries coming in, but I think the com combination of the homegrown and the and the retailers and the, and the customers getting excited for all sorts of beers. There, there's a lot of beer that's poured in uh, Boston and in, I guess in Massachusetts in general, a lot of beer that's sold that, that isn't from Massachusetts, that isn't from Boston. Walk into bars all the time and it's, you know, I mean, look, y we were just talking about San Diego and, and it was, oh, well, they have West Coast IPAs and they're known for that. Boston doesn't have anything that it's really known for in terms of a style, right? Um, not in the same way that San Diego is known for West Coast hoppy beers. Um, and then you walk into a bar and you see nothing but West Coast IPAs, you know, from Green Flash and Stone and everything else. Uh, that, that seems like it, it, it might be part of the problem. There aren't enough... Uh, I don't know if it's a, a quality thing, if it's what it is, but it, there aren't enough beers or there's not enough support from the retail end supporting the, the local market. Um, but you guys are out, you know, out there way more than I am in, in you know, you're on the street, Peter. It's you're you're talking you to all these people, Boston, JC. <laughs> you're the one making the list. So I, I guess the question really is, like, are there enough quality beers? Are, are we doing enough on the local front? to really be able to claim a good beer culture because so much of it seems like it depends on local. And so much of it seems right now like it's coming from the outside in. Sure, so I, I think there's a, an inflection point that's happening right now over the last couple of years um, and a, a true evolution that we're seeing, not just in uh, brand, new, brand new breweries, but breweries that have been around for quite a while and have established a footprint, um, have a giant packaging line, a uh, brand new facility, you know, massive tank farms that can actually meet some of the volume and the demand that's out there. Um, if we personally, com if Trillium comes up with a, a recipe and a, a beer that really strikes a chord with fans, we brew a 10 barrel batch of it and it's gone in a day and a half. So it never has a chance to actually hit um, um, row 34 and public house and, and uh, kind of the, the beer centric places, never mind kind of a broader market, right. never mind the bottle shops, never mind, uh, you know, even 20 accounts. So it's going to take a little while. We are at an inflection point. It's going to take a little while before um, some breweries are able to grow to certain critical volumes to kind of, um, if you want to say, put, put Boston on the map. Um, and I think, like I said before, there are some, um, some existing breweries that are brown for a few years longer than us, um, and maybe even a couple of decades that are changing what they do. Um, they're evolving as well. So uh, I, I think that the, the new entries are help pushing that evolution. Um, and it's a really exciting time across the country, but specifically in this area, because of the lack of a green flash or a cigar city. Right. Uh, or a new Belgium or something like that. They consider have this massive innovati innovative portfolio. Uh, I'll ask this for, for you guys, kind of dovetail off that question. What are you guys doing to, to promote a better beer culture in Boston, Megan and Peter? What do you guys, as a retailer and as somebody who visits all these accounts and has to sell in every day, how are you growing the beer scene here? I think, I mean, if you don't mind if I... No, please. Um, education is huge. I mean, I think that, you know, for me, the amount of time, like, Obviously, I spend a lot of my time tasting and trying and curating the list, but on the flip side of that, the amount of time that you actually dedicate to educating your staff and the people who are actually on the floor talking to guests, selling the beer, understanding the stories behind it, like without, without my staff, without the people at Row 34 who do this every single day and come in for a shift and I'm like, guys, I kicked six lines, so there's six new beers. And they come in with an enthusiasm and an excitement to learn. Right. And, you know, and on the back end, that requires that I put a lot of effort into 
you know, schooling myself and making sure that I'm providing everyone with the proper materials to succeed. But without that educational portion. And that's one on one to the consumer. Yeah. But Peter, I mean, are you educating these retailers? Yeah, I mean, the, I will, what's their response? I will, Full, full disclosure, our field guy, Matt Lambeau, is, is our guy on the street in Boston, has been for years, and he does such a good job being visible and being uh, available, too, when yep. new beers come out. There's just an onslaught of, you know, if every brewer has one new beer, that's our, you know, a couple hundred beers that come to the market. So there's a constant, you're fighting this tide of staying on top of that education level. And I think, you know, to, you know, Megan was talking about the, you know, her beer list, your beer list is awesome. It's great, and there's not a lot of uh, retailers that have adopted that swath of dedication to a, a craft lineup, and most bars have at least one or two craft, you know, craft rotators, or they'll, they'll they'll talk about different beers that they have available or spots they have available. But they look at their numbers and they say, okay, our biggest seller is still domestic light beer, and it's really hard for retailers to make that adjustment because they're looking at their numbers. If you say, all right, well, we've got Grey Lady, it's a great Belgian whip beer, like, well, I can't take off Blue Moon, it's my number two seller. And our mm -hmm. argument is, well, Grey Lady would be your number two seller, you make more margin on it, so you start talking numbers, and it's you know, educating re retailers to their own business, because they've been, they've been so successful at what they've been doing for so long, and I feel like the, the attitudes of a lot of consumers are changing faster than the retailers mm -hmm. are catching up mm -hmm. with. So then it's a matter of, does a beer list at a certain bar that I'm going to already, if my friends are at a bar and they say, come out, am I gonna say, ah, no, because they don't have good beer? It's like, no, I'll go there and find something I like. Mm -hmm. So it's changing the retailer's attitude that, hey, you could actually be you know, um, exposing more business and, and, and creating more revenue. It's all, I mean, as much as we're in it for philanthropic is reasons, that, it's is also that effective? business. It's the toughest part of the business, and, and at some point, uh, at some days, because you're talking to retailers that have been doing it the same way for so many years. Um, but it's also, I feel like there's the most opportunity. If you can get someone to understand what's going on in terms of, hey, there actually is a cultural movement and shift. It's not a fad, it's more of a trend that you, know, you can show all the data you want of beer sales are down, but craft sales are up, and all those data numbers. But until someone actually adopts that and tries it, it it's, it's tricky, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard. So I guess, what's the solution? If you, if you can't convince them, uh, how, do you, how do you take off that, that blue moon handle? How do you, if the consumer's moving faster and the retailer isn't willing to play ball, well, what's the solution? But, I mean, I wish I had the answer to that. I guess that would be uh, <laughs> well, a man, that's why I put you up there. Yeah. You <laughs> have all the answers, right? Well, the answer is do away the three-tier system and start opening your own. You, know, <laughs> you can serve everywhere, right? All the owners have it. So, I mean, that's... I think when you talk about the culture, you know, every definition of culture you ever see and includes either art, food, music, language. I'll put beer in that category because it's what we're here for. Um, but it's always a collective. It's always as a group. And so one great beer bar or one great brewery isn't going to change the culture of any spots. So then you talk about places with a high concentration of local brewers and they start the culture off. And that's what the barrier you all were talking about is the geographic barriers to getting a collective movement together. And this, this brewery, Harpoon and, and Trillium and Sam do, do a lot for craft beer in general in the city, but is it enough to spur that change over from and, and domestics is it, to is craft? Is it collective? Is there enough collaboration happening in Boston to sort of drive some of that? I mean, some other cities are very collaborative. Well, I think from, I mean, from an on-premise perspective, I think there's, you're starting to see the shift. There are people that have, you know, worked at these well-known establishments, you know, example that comes to mind for me is Michael Cooney, who's opening up the Brewer's Fork, comes from the public house. I couldn't, I mean, he's been a huge supporter of the program at Roe. I've become friends with him just from having him come in here and drink beers, and I couldn't be more excited for his bar to open so I can have somewhere to go drink because I don't want to drink at work. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, I mean, you're starting to see, it's, it's slow, it's not something that's happening in a rapid way, but you're starting to see people branch out and start to emphasize the importance of the draft program and the bottle list just as much as they would their food menu or their wine program. It's not an afterthought for them. Yeah. And I also think, I mean, a huge part of that is approaching your list. You know, when you talk about like the production, we're talking about the production level that Trillium has, like I'll get three half barrels of Trillium and they'll be gone in two days maybe right. and I you know having the approach to your list that it is a fluid moving piece of your restaurant just like you know we've seen the shift in food culture people want to eat the freshest food they want to eat what they can get you know right out of the boat they're excited to try whatever the whole fish is at row 34 because that's what we got from Red's Best right on the fish pier the same thing is happening you can mirror that with beer 
Right. I think people are really excited for that fluidity. So I, I promised myself I'd do this, and mm -hmm. I know I'm going to just pivot real quickly and, and kind of change course. But um, I was able to get my hands on some numbers today, which are pretty interesting, from 2014. Uh, the important takeaway, I think, from this is that all this stuff is always directional. Um, JC and I were talking about this a minute ago, but like, no matter what you're getting, IRI, Nielsen, Beer Institute, BA data, like w whatever it is, it's all just sort of a piece of the puzzle, um, and it, it's, it's representative. Um, so the, the data that I have is from the Beer Institute, but it was shipment data um, from 2014. Massachusetts beer shipments uh, down about 1.8% total. I mean, this is, this is sales to retail, so, um, you know, all beer, a lot of that is domestic. Um, again, this data is coming from the Beer Institute. Their members are reporting, uh, and, you know, th these are folks like Anheuser-Busch, Miller Coors, the bigger guys, so it's, it's probably missing a lot of the craft stuff that's happening, um, but they estimate for that. Regardless, only 13 states in the U.S., uh, last year had positive uh, STRs um, and a couple sort of stuck out to me uh, California Colorado and Florida really stuck out to me now these are um, you know minor minor gains you know these are increases of uh, a half percent on average um, but I guess what is it about those markets where it's working you know all beer is up it, at a time when, you know, most of the country beer shipments are down. What is it about California, Colorado, and Florida? Do you guys think? And ma maybe Peter, this is where you're able to share a little bit of insight. But sure. What uh, is it about I mean, those markets that just that all top, beer volumes are up? Yeah, without without you know looking too far into it, without having seen them, my thoughts of California and Colorado, I would say that that is where you start to see a cultural shift, right? We're talking about trying to build one here where maybe they, their overall cultural shift is already in place. So pe more people are catching on to the more retailers are already at that kind of, they're in chapter two, whereas, you know, Boston might be in chapter one of what's going to be the best thing for the beer culture. Florida, I think, is probably the outlier in that market as more of they're just younger at the game, um, not to diminish our business to a game, but, uh, you know, craft beer in general, it, what's the first thing you think of? It's certainly not Florida. Um, but I think they've been under a tremendous growth pattern because, you know, just like all the people that, you know, travel and, and want to eat fresh, like you were saying, they want to drink better beer. Uh, a couple of major craft brewers have started to put in a lot of infrastructure resources. Uh, I think Tampa Bay Brewing and then uh, Cigar City we talked about. There's a couple other Funky Buddha. Oh, Funky, Funky Buddha. Yeah. Thank you. I was trying to think of that one. But there's a lot more uh, interest. And I think those beers are much more rare to get if you're in other parts of the country. So places like San Diego will put the phone call into someone in Florida and say, what does it take to get Funky Buddha to San Diego? Here's what we can offer. You know, so it's like those, that's a more desirable market. So I think Florida might be the outlier where Colorado and, and San Diego are proven, and Florida's probably on the cusp of a... That's my best guess. Like I said, it's what, not, not where it's gold. What, what about from like the legislative front? My, my, actually, my guess, my best guess, not, I'm actually formally a, a data analysis <laughs> guy. It's not your day to day? No, not anymore. <laughs> uh, although I weave it in. But um, I mean, you, you look at new brewery openings every quarter, and where, where's, what does that chart look like uh, versus beer sales? Right. Um, so clearly, there's something that's happening with beer culture specifically. Um, it's becoming, uh, there's, there's better permeation in a more broad-based way. There's uh, far more players. Um, our production volume is, in, is probably less than what Harpoon spills on an annual basis, what we actually package right now. Um, so it's not even a blip on, the, on, the, um, on, the, on this report. Um, but it will be in a couple of years from now. So uh, my guess is that this data doesn't capture what's happening in a specific segmentation of the market right. that probably is more passion, is more quote unquote culture driven, more over than just something that gets you drunk. Right. You know? is that, yeah, I was going to say, is that number a shift in volume or in, in dollars? Because if it's volume, then it's actually going the right direction. It's like we want people drinking it less. Is vo this is volume, right? right. It's so not dollars. So you're not, yeah. Right. So if people are trading in the four domestic lights that would have consumed for two IPAs, there's, de there's quality, definitely I'm an all element in. of the, <laughs> of the trade off, for sure. sure. Um, how about, you know, I mean, Massachusetts in general 
seems like a pretty friendly state to do business as a craft brewer. I mean, you can self-distribute, you can get the farm brewery license, seems like you can get off the ground pretty quickly. Um, that seems to be a characteristic in states uh, that have, you know, great craft beer cultures. You know, it's, it's usually pretty easy to do business there as a small startup. Um, I know Boston was a struggle, but in terms of just Massachusetts as a state, pretty easy from, from your point of view? Uh, I don't know. I've only opened one brewery so far. <laughs> so it, it, prob <laughs> it probably comes down to the, the local municipality, right? So do they have a, a zoning variance process? Or do they say, ah, brewery kind of sounds like a manufacturing facility. It's a buy right use in this, uh, in this building that's been zoned for, for industrial use. Uh, so it really comes down to the town, at the, at the town level. Um, but from a state level, of course, self-distribution at these tiny, tiny volumes that we're pr talking about, it's critical for us to get off the ground. Um, the ability to sell at retail, um, it's currently about 80 to 90 percent, depending on the month, uh, of our revenue stream. Without those things, we'd be on an entirely different trajectory than we are today, um, hopefully opening a, a new um, 30 barrel brew house at the end of this year. Is there more to be done on that front, do you think? Or is, can, there, can there be more that needs to evolve? I mean, it seems like it's pretty friendly, but... I, I'm uh, not the right guy to ask. I'm very biased. I want things to be as easy as possible <laughs> for, uh, for brewery operations Well, what would make it better? What would make it easier for you to do business? Well, in, in Boston, you, need, you, you can't open, quote unquote, a bar. You need to be able to serve food, and that's why we've got these delicious pretzel, pretzels here at the Harpoon Beer Hall, Yeah. right? Um, uh, but I'm su I suspect that most people that come here on a Friday night aren't coming to have a sit down for a delicious meal of pretzels. <laughs> They're yeah. coming for the beer, right? And, the, right? and the fun and the culture that, that they experience here at the beer hall. Um, we can't serve pints at our tiny little shop because we, don't, we obviously cannot fit a, a kitchen in there um, to be able to, to make any semblance of food in there. We'd love to be able to serve pints, but it's not possible. So there's a couple things at the, at the local level that could be better. Um, would improve beer culture. Um, if you could, if there were 20 tiny little trillium-like breweries across the city, I think everybody would say, hell yeah, this is, this is awesome. But it's also probably not something that is going to happen either. It's going to take a bunch of s small guys who start as a contract brand, who um, you know, do the slog for a while and, and get through a couple of years, and you know, prove to a bank that they uh, have a good sound business model and can open up their own little shop. So we're at an inflection point, but it's going to take some time. Right. Uh, okay, so uh, final word here, last question. Um, real briefly, short answer, 140 characters, your tweet of the night. Um, what's the best way to improve the beer culture in Boston? We'll start with Peter. Uh, I'm going to bounce back to what Megan and JC were talking about earlier. Education at the, at the retail level and at... Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> we didn't talk about that earlier. <laughs> Education at the retail level and at the, cu at the, uh, at the customer level, too. And it, it's, you know, if, if the geographic constraints of Boston have it where the culture can't be built by a brewer, then the burden falls onto the retailer. And, you know, that's, it's up to us to educate them and the people going to those places. Sorry. Education. That was two tweets. <laughs> uh, I would just say having an open mind. I think, uh, you know, for me, talking about, you know, working in a restaurant, Going in, this is going to be this tweet is going to be w way over 140 characters, so I apologize. Um, but I would say, you know, coming, message. <laughs> <laughs> you know, coming into a bar with an open mind and, you know, the excitement for exploring, you know, what that bar has to offer. Well, I'm shorter than I thought. Oh, there I you go. that could be 140 characters. <laughs> you know. JC, hop contracts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> There you go. Hop contract. Shortest, shortest tweet. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Well, um, I, I know you guys probably have some questions for these guys. Uh, unfortunately, we got to move on to our next panel, but please find them. We're going to be here till 8 o'clock, so pick their brains. Big round of applause for JC, Megan, and Peter. Thank you. So uh, I think while these guys uh, trade their mics with our next speakers, uh, Chris from Harpoon is going to come up here and say a couple words, um, and then our next speakers are getting mic'd. Um, but he wants to talk a little bit about Harpoon Helps, uh, the organization that we're, uh, the philanthropic arm of, of Harpoon that we're raising money for tonight.
And so, um, speaking of uh, education and Thanks, uh, an open mind and hop contracts, hopefully this is kind of this is our our classroom here. So hopefully there's a lot of learning that's happening with a lot of the hop contracts. Drink some beers, have some fun. I wanted to thank uh, these guys and everybody for coming out tonight, but specifically wanted to introduce Jesse Cox, uh, who is our director of Harpoon Helps and Sponsorships, just to say a few brief words about where the money that you paid to come tonight is actually going to. So Jesse Cox. Thanks, Chris and everybody. I just want to say thank you on behalf of Harpoon Helps. Um, you know, we are a 501c3 organization Good. with our mission of donating in kind that? and cash donations um, through our marquee uh, fundraising uh, events uh, to local uh, nonprofits. Last year, we were able to contribute to 275 different organizations across 12 states, and that value was over $720,000. So, you know, we're really looking to increase that this year. Uh, thank you. Please come out for an event this year. Go to harpandhelps.com. We've got uh, six marquee events that Final you can number. help out from many different charities. But again, your donations tonight are really going a long way Don't to help us, here. enable us to support more charities with their fundraising efforts this year. So again, just a big thank you. Uh, we appreciate it and have a great time tonight. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. So I, uh, I, I just ducked over there to talk to Ashley, who you all met when you checked in. Uh, we raised $1,500 tonight for uh, Harpoon Help, so thank you. About 100 and 130 people here tonight all contributing. Uh, it's, it's really awesome to see. I mean, it's one of the major reasons why we do this thing. Um, you know, at, at every stop, we're going to do uh, eight of these events this year. Uh, we'll stop in eight different cities across the country. And um, we're going to raise money for different charitable organizations along the way. Um, so uh, thank you guys for donating.